Today, we have uh, Mugda Gupte, Product Manager at Tinder, joining us from LA. My name is uh, Mugda Gupte. I'm uh, really excited to be talking to you guys about product growth in global markets. Um, I want to kick off the conversation by setting up the context uh, as to where, I, where my perspective on international growth comes from. Uh, so I work as a product manager at Tinder. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with what Tinder is, Tinder is a dating app. And we've been the highest grossing non-gaming app uh, for several uh, weeks now in a row, both on Apple and Google. Uh, and we've had over 43 billion matches total uh, up until now. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that um, we're in this really fortunate position of even having the problem of focusing on uh, international growth. It's a, it's a good problem. Um, and we are available in 190 different markets uh, and we support over 40 languages total. Uh, so with that context, uh, let's dive into it. Uh, so there's three levers to growth. There's user growth, where you're uh, focused on a very specific demographic and you try to optimize on that demographic, or you want to expand into other demographics who could find your product useful. The second is international growth, uh, which is focused on opening up to other countries, other markets than where you actually began. Um, and the third lever is uh, revenue. So at this point, you pretty much achieved product market fit, and now you're either going to increase your pricing because your product provides that much value to users, or you could go the other way and um, reduce the price or discount the price and make it affordable to a larger audience. Uh, today, we're going to be mostly focused on international growth. One thing to point out about international growth is that unlike some of the other aspects of the business, international growth doesn't just focus on a vertical uh, or doesn't just focus on one aspect of the business. But as a PM in this space, uh, you will get to explore uh, a more uh, broader horizontal um, side of the business. So you could be dealing with problems in acquisition of a user, activation, retention, or monetization. So I find that really exciting about this space. All right, so for international growth, uh, I'm, I've tried to put across a framework and then dive into specific use cases to explain specific aspects. Broadly speaking, for international growth, a PM or a creator needs to focus on two areas. One is voice of the product. In this case, you're not really focused so much on building new products, but you're trying to understand how can you message or communicate the value of all your features that you've already built to a new market, uh, such that it's relevant to them, uh, such that they can relate to the value that you're creating with your product. Uh, and the second aspect is when you modify uh, your existing product. This is closer to traditional product management, where you assess needs, you decide whether you want to build it or not, uh, and then you go ahead and build it. Um, I'll start by focusing on voice of the product. Uh, what does voice of the product really mean? Uh, so if you think about Tinder, uh, when did you first become aware of Tinder as a product? You probably heard about it from a friend of yours, or you saw somebody on the bus using it, or you saw an ad on YouTube uh, that talked about Tinder. So a product starts communicating to the end user much, much before they even download the app or sign up uh, on the platform. And then this voice sort of continues uh, and the narrative continues up until the point that they become a user and even throughout their journey within the app itself. Um, so the voice of the product should do three things. The first of which is it should be able to address locally relevant use cases. What I mean by that is if your app started in say Germany, but now you wanna to go to an APAC market, then you should be able to 
uh, address uh, a locally relevant need uh, through, through the value that you've created in the product. So let's look at an example um, of uh, Gillette, which is a razor manufacturing company. It started here in the US, but they wanted to launch in India. They thought this was like a promising market because there's over 1 billion people in India and their only competition was this low grade single blade razor at the time. Uh, the parent company for Gillette is uh, Procter & Gamble, and they launched their Mark III line in 2004 in India. They were able to communicate their core values, which is it's a better quality, uh, it gives you a, a better shave than any of the alternatives, etc. Uh, their sales were kind of okay. They were expecting a much better response from the market, but their sales were kind of flatlined. So when they started investigating what was really going on, what they realized is uh, because of an underlying assumption that they made, they weren't able to address some of the locally relevant use cases. Um, and the assumption they'd made was that all of their users had running water or access to running water, which was not the case in India, which is so they had to adopt their messaging and change the voice of the product uh, to be able to address this use case. Once they did that in 2008, uh, they saw uh, a huge uplift in response from the market. The second aspect that PMs or creators should keep in mind uh, when they think about voice of the product is brand partnerships. So when a product is very new in the market, uh, the slate for perception is gonna be completely blank uh, in a user's mind. Uh, and the brand partners or brands that you choose to associate with uh, kind of go back to building your own perception and the amount of trust that a user will have in your brand. Uh, one good example of improved perception is when Levi, the jeans company, partnered with TikTok. And they were, they were really able to change the perception of uh, the target audience, which is younger demographics, which is the core audience for TikTok. Another way you can think of brand partnerships is uh, not so much to improve perception, but to improve your reach and revenue. Uh, an example that uh, I've used here is the example of Netflix. Uh, partnering with T-Mobile, which is a phone carrier here in the US. Uh, so essentially what they do is any user who has two phone lines with T-Mobile automatically gets free Netflix. This ends up benefiting both partners in, in, in increasing the user base because they now share user bases. And, um, and of course, it increases the revenue opportunity. The third and final thing that you need to keep in mind when you're thinking of about voice of the product is uh, achieving great translation. So this really comes into play more so for the users who've signed up and are now on the app. Uh, when most companies decide to go beyond just machine translated uh, language translations, they'll end up working with third party translators. Now, one thing to keep in mind here is that third party translators get paid by the number of words that they translate. So while they're trying to achieve the best level of uh, translation for you, they, they're more focused on getting as much translated as possible. So one thing that helps uh, is for the PM, to be able to provide the context of how uh, they built the product, why they built a certain feature, what is the objective behind building this feature, and what value do they want to communicate to uh, users in specific markets. Uh, another, another thing that I've found useful is to also establish what type of tone are you looking for? Um, so it could be, it could be just, uh, here I've explained, like, uh, explain a feature like you would 
explain it to your friend. Uh, whereas if it's something like terms of service, then it would be a more formal tone like you would use maybe in a government document, for example. Um, so that's the third and final aspect of voice of the product. That brings me to the next section, which is how do you modify the product? Modifying the product is a more involved process. It's more expensive because it's going to take more time, effort, and it's going to take more engineering resources. So one of the most important things you can do before you start going in and modifying things uh, is to really study the market well. Uh, at Tinder, we spend the same amount of time studying the market and figuring out even if we do need to change something in the product. And uh, if we need to change it, what is it that we need to change and how can we make it most effective? So the three tools that I use for uh, studying the market is internet anthropology. So tap into all the resources available on YouTube, Reddit, Facebook, uh, look at uh, App Annie, understand what are the most popular apps in the market that you're targeting and try to figure out what is the aesthetic that people in that market are looking for. Uh, the second tool I use is qualitative analysis. So uh, survey users uh, do user interviews one-on-one -on -one, and this will give you a lot of anecdotal data. And the third component is quantitative analysis where uh, it's less focused on anecdotal and more focused on getting statistically significant insights. So if you're in the lucky position of having the scale of data where you can get quantitative insights, then a good way to do it is to select a few metrics and then go and compare those metrics uh, between your target market and your base market. So if you're a company that started in the US and you want to uh, enter the German market, then you would select the metrics that are important to you and you would compare uh, how uh, users behave in the US versus in Germany. Um, an example of how I've used it is, uh, we looked at the quantitative data in some of our APAC markets and compared the day one retention of our users to the day one retention of the users in the US. And we found that although we expected it to be a little bit lower, it was much lower than what we had anticipated. So we started like digging into this a little bit more and we, we used qualitative analysis and conducted surveys, conducted some user research, sat one-on-one -on -one with our users and asked them questions about their experience going through Tinder. And what we realized is that we'd made some assumptions being in our US oriented bubble, uh, which we didn't realize were necessarily true in these newer markets. For example, uh, in user interviews, users mentioned that they didn't really know what this concept of swiping right and left was and what does like and no really mean. Um, being a PM in the US, we just assumed uh, that everybody is kind of aware of how Tinder really works. Another uh, factor that we didn't anticipate was uh, users had this feeling that they didn't want to pass on a profile because uh, it would hurt the other person's feelings, uh, which is not true because Tinder is a double opt-in platform. Uh, so only if you like somebody and they like you, would you uh, actually know about each other. Um, so we have made these assumptions, which were just not holding true in some of our other markets. Um, so what we ended up doing is that we expanded the existing tutorial that we had uh, and created a more play-by-play, screen-by-screen uh, tutorial, which was very explicit, which showed uh, the value of each step and explained everything in a lot of detail. And when we were creating this, uh, we sort of stuck to Tinder's aesthetic, but also incorporated some of the APAC aesthetic where users try to, uh, where users like to try out things with their own hands 
before they get comfortable actually doing it. Uh, so we took some of this feedback and we incorporated it and built an introductory tutorial. And that really gave us uh, the effect that we were expecting, which is it increased uh, the retention on day one. That brings me to my final point when you're modifying a product, which is to fork or not to fork, which means that does this insight or does this new modification apply only to a specific market or is it going to be relevant uh, all across the globe? Uh, if it is going to be relevant only in a specific market, then a PM has to make the decision on whether they want to create a separate version of their app for that market alone. Um, now for Tinder, that doesn't really work because with 190 countries, if we start building a specific version for each country, then it's going to get really complex at some point. Um, but the cases where this could work is if your app uh, is only applicable in a few markets and the revenue upside is much, much higher if you do branch out. Uh, bear in mind that if you do choose to branch out, then you're going to have to account for the resources, engineering and otherwise, that you'll have to put in to maintain that separate version uh, and prevent it from breaking in the future. Uh, just a brief overview of the takeaways. When you're focusing on international growth, focus on two aspects, voice of the product and actually modifying the product. When you focus on voice of the product, make sure you're addressing locally relevant use cases. Make sure your brand partners reflect the kind of perception that you want to create in the new market and uh, try and focus uh, as much as resources allow on great translation because that really sets the language and tone for your product. And when you're modifying the product, do it with a lot of study of the specific market before you make changes. And when you do make changes, uh, you'll have to make the decision of whether you want to fork the product or not. Uh, with that, I'll conclude my talk. Thank you so much. Uh, and I'll open it up to questions. Thanks a lot, Munda. Uh, so everyone, uh, you can use the, the chat uh, here to ask questions and we'll just go uh, first, first come, first serve, uh, or depending if Munda finds the question more interesting, uh, she could uh, take it. Uh, all right, so the first question forking is, question. is yeah, uh, forking question. Uh, the question is, what about using uh, feature flags? Can you elaborate a little bit more on that, Thomas? Um, I guess by feature flags, what you mean, Thomas, I'm making an assumption here is um, to have flags that can turn on and off a feature. Uh, I hope I, I made the right assumption there. But, but, but you're right. Um, we do use feature flags, but we try and uh, not create a separate version specifically for one market because then that even if you have feature flags that help you turn on and off uh, a feature without actually making changes to the code, what that still does is that increases the amount of testing that you do uh, and the amount of maintenance work that you put in for uh, that particular feature. Um, so, so the ideal situation is that you have created a feature that applies to uh, all markets globally. Uh, but if not, then again, you'll have to make that trade-off decision as to whether it gives you enough of a either monetary upside or enough of a different metric uh, lift to uh, still implement feature packs. Um, the next question is, uh, do you A-B test? Uh, yes, we absolutely A-B test. Uh, the policy at Tinder is that uh, launch every feature as an A-B test uh, to get a response uh, at the ground level. Um, the next question is, what is the number of- May, may I have a follow-up on the A-B test? Yes. Uh, what does your tooling look like? 
do you have a homegrown solution or do you experiment with uh, commercially available ones like optimizely and so that's that's a good question so uh initially we did experiment with a few different uh, ab testing platforms that are third party and which can be integrated uh, but what that does is it still doesn't give you enough of a uh, enough control on some internal metrics and data which is too sensitive to share with a third party so we ended up building an in-house solution and that has proven to be much much uh, more beneficial for us uh, but uh, I, I understand that not all startups would have those resources. So using a third party AB, AB testing platform is totally fine in your initial days. Cool. Um, I'll, I'll let you pick up the questions because I see now we have uh, even more. Uh, cool. So I think we were at the, what's the number of premium accounts compared to normal user? How high is the willingness to pay for additional features? This is from Pamela Renz and Andre Brueggemann. Yeah, I wish I could answer that question, but I cannot answer a question on numbers. Uh, moving on to the next one. Uh, could you please elaborate on internet anthropology? Um, yeah, so internet anthropology, I, I don't think this is like a phrase that exists, uh, you know, I just made it up essentially. But internet anthropology, I find, I find that there's so many resources on the internet. Um, especially when you're looking at international markets, you don't have as much access uh, sitting in your home country to these international markets. So for example, on YouTube, I follow this channel, it's called Dating Without Borders. Uh, and what they do is they interview people from different countries to get their perspective on dating, on being single. And this kind of gives me a window into um, getting users' perspective in different countries on dating. Uh, similarly, uh, you can use Facebook groups to get so much anecdotal insight and information. Uh, now, bear in mind that this is going to have some sort of selection bias. So only people who are okay with putting up content uh, will do so on these platforms. Uh, but another good source I found is Reddit threads, and people are much more vocal on Reddit uh, than anywhere else. Uh, cool. Yeah, Reddit is like a gold mine. You can just dive into a topic and, and see all of these elaborated replies and analysis for things. Exactly. And uh, people, I'm really surprised, spent so much time answering questions on Reddit or Quora. Uh, it's really amazing to me. Uh, cool. Uh, let's see. If a product feature, uh, if a product or feature is performing poorly in the market, how do you know if it's because it wasn't explained right or uh, lacked the correct voice or framing? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, so I think we at Tinder we've definitely had like hits and misses. Uh, so the way to do that is uh, test everything launch every product or feature as an A-B test. That way you're not exposing a huge chunk of your users uh, to the change that you're betting on. Um, and you get, get results pretty early on. Uh, even before you A-B test, when you come up with the design, you can put it up on usertesting.com or similar user testing sites. Uh, and that'll give you a pretty quick uh, turn around on whether this feature is uh, working or not. And one advantage of uh, using something like usertesting.com is that you'll get a more uh, qualitative analysis of exactly what is not working about that feature. Is it that people are not able to understand uh, what you're trying to say through the feature or they just don't find it valuable enough? Um, I hope that helps answer that question. Uh, have you faced a problem with the scam or spam accounts and how did you solve that? Um, so I'm a, I'm a little bit removed from that side of the business, but yes, uh, with scale, uh, 
the number of spam accounts that get created are going to increase. Uh, so if you're a startup, you're not very visible, uh, you're probably going to have uh, that problem, but at, at a lower scale. But as you become more recognized, uh, you'll see that the scale of that problem also increases by that much. Uh, and the way we uh, sort of combat that is we have a whole dedicated team that looks at uh, traffic protection, uh, that looks at how to authenticate accounts. Uh, so we have a whole team dedicated to that. Uh, some other questions. Uh, is there a heuristic evaluation conducted in the design process? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, so with design, what typically happens is uh, the product design team is interfacing with all the different teams across the company. And what uh, they really need to do uh, and they're responsible for is to keep the design consistent. Uh, even if there's a new feature that's coming in, it can look very different from Tinder's um, you know, base aesthetic. And they have to make sure that uh, designs from different features don't clash with each other. Uh, a lot of times what happens is uh, product managers really want to highlight their feature uh, because they're only thinking from one dimension and not thinking about the whole app. Uh, so oftentimes there is uh, like a different, different direction that product managers want to take and product designers want to take. And what we do in that case is uh, we either um, discuss it with a larger group within the company. So we get uh, inputs from uh, people who are not related to the project, or we again, go back to usertesting.com and see what uh, users are going to think about this. So that's how we sort of evaluate design and uh, make decisions with them. Um, as someone who wants to do a career side step into product management, what advice uh, could you share? Um, so I actually started off my career as a software engineer. I worked at Yahoo for a while uh, in their ads division, and that's where I started developing an interest in, for product management. Uh, for me, uh, the segue into uh, product management was really my background in ads. So I started at Tinder as a product manager in ads. So the, the route that I took personally was, um, I, got no, I got knowledge of a specific domain and then uh, stepped into, from the technical side into the more uh, product management side. Um, some of the things that you could do is practice mock interview viewing with other other product people um, because I've I've noticed that that really helps open up that creative side of uh, the sort of thinking that PMs need to do. Uh, cool. What have been the most important points when finding an appropriate translation service? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. So most of the translation services are third party translators. They're uh, things that um, platforms that provide for gig workers. So TaskRabbit is one example. Um, a good way to test out if this uh, translation service is working for you is to have a common brief and send it out to multiple translation agencies and uh, based on their response, uh, their translated response, you can uh, sort of have somebody who's knowledgeable in that language uh, go through it and uh, give a qualitative assessment of whether this translation achieves uh, what you're trying to communicate through this uh, app. Uh, based on your previous answer, what is the difference between the marketer and the product manager for ads? Um, that's a good question. So I think marketers are focused more so on the 
you know, voice of the product side of things, but uh, product managers are more focused on uh, making the product better and easier to understand. So although both PMs and marketers focus on uh, voice of the product, they just have a different perspective. Marketers have a more user-facing perspective and PMs are trying to analyze how can they look inwards into the app and make the app more understandable and clear uh, to the end user through what they can say within the app. Uh, what was surprising or fun that you've learned about people's dating behavior in one or the other market? Um, this goes back to making assumptions based on your primary market. So one of the things at Tinder was that we knew uh, early on that Tinder is mostly to remove the awkwardness when someone's trying to approach a stranger with the purpose of dating them. Uh, but what we realized when we entered some of the APAC markets is that dating is uh, not really a big concept in some of the APAC markets. So um, people used Tinder very differently uh, in some markets. They used it more so for social discovery, just finding interesting people that they can chat with, uh, interesting people who, who are in their vicinity, who, can, who they can connect with. Uh, so that was kind of surprising. That reminds me of an um, anecdotal story of a friend who used OkCupid okay to find roommates because I wanted to have interesting people and OkCupid okay has these blocks of text and, and you know, it's more, more of the old school where you can put all your preferences and answer all these quizzes and you get this match percentage. And that was apparently a very good way to find roommates. Exactly, exactly. So you never know. Uh, surprising behaviors always emerge. And um, good, very good insight with social discovery. Yep. Uh, what is the software or technical tool that product managers in ads uh, may need to use? Um, I think from my experience, a lot of apps who monetize through ads will use one of the bigger platforms like Google or Facebook to actually serve the ads. Uh, so they don't have, um, so there's the supply side and demand side of uh, the advertising market, right? And um, what, what most apps do is they rely for, uh, on Google or Facebook to give them the supply and they just show it on their app. So, Essentially, most apps create these virtual billboards within the app where Google and Facebook can then go ahead and place an ad and then there is a revenue sharing model. So I think having familiarity with how uh, Google's ad engine works or how Facebook's ad platform works is useful when you're a PM in the ad space. Uh, I think we have time for a few more questions. I like a lot of questions tonight. We we uh, usually like have five to um, seven, eight. Okay. So that's, that's very good engagement, guys. Thanks. All right. Let's take a few more. Uh, how did the engagement growth behave since the global lockdown uh, due to COVID uh, and the launch of Passport for Free? Um. I feel like, you know, COVID has affected all of us. It's impacted all our lives and our patterns so much that we really didn't know like what we expected uh, when it happened. So, so we didn't really know what pattern we wanted to look at or, or what we expected. Uh, so it feels like there's, there's definitely um, launching Passport as a free service. Uh, definitely like surprised users, they, it delighted users, and they wanted to explore this feature a little bit more. Um, uh, how do you work with product vision and product strategy? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, so when I first started as a PM, uh, I had a very small scope. 
uh, I only focused on one tiny feature uh, and my scope in terms of timeline was only the next month. So as I started taking on more and more products and more features, that, um, that scope of the number of products in my, uh, in my toolkit expanded. So I think when you're growing as a PM, you start with a small surface area and uh, focus on a small um, you know, look ahead time. And then slowly you start expanding from one feature to, a, uh, to an entire product. And in terms of timeline and product vision, uh, your vision also starts growing more and more. So you start looking forward to the next six months, uh, to the next year, uh, as you start growing your influence as a PM. And as for product strategy, um, I think it's pretty much the same. Like as you increase the amount of look ahead time, you start associating uh, your product more and more with the company strategy. But it's always good, I've found, uh, to be able to map the feature that you're working on to the company-wide product strategy because uh, that not only helps you analyze whether or not you're on the right track, but it also helps motivate engineers and other uh, resources that you're working with uh, to ultimately let them know that whatever work they're doing, whatever efforts they're putting in, are contributing to taking the company forward. Um, I hope that answers the question. Uh, Passport is not free anymore, but it was a great promo. Uh, did it pay back big, big time in general? Um, I feel like. Uh, Passport just being a surprise uh, promo for users uh, really generated a lot of delight. And uh, in that sense, yes, uh, it did pay back because, you know, we're happy as PMs whenever users find increased value in the product. Uh, cool. I think that brings us to the end of the questions. Yes, thanks a lot, uh, Mugda, and, and also thank you for taking this extra time. That will be the end of our stream for tonight, and looking forward to see you guys at the next event.